Hello, Simbracers, and sorry for the uh, late start. As usual, you know, lazy devs, if you don't change uh, your uh, development um, build from Steam to, you know, the public version, and you wait for the last moment, you get crashes. So that will teach me again. Um, I hope everybody is coming uh, back into the new chat, to the new uh, YouTube link uh, I have posted already on the old one. So hopefully people will be online in a very short uh, time, I hope. Uh, and um, yeah, I can see already people coming. All right, okay. So I will wait a little bit while you guys, you know, find again the, uh, the new YouTube link. Sorry again about that, my fault, but at least we survived this, this war with just about 10 minutes of uh, delay. No big deal, I hope. Um, all right, so uh, what we're going to do uh, today? Well, tonight we are going to uh, walk um, Zandvoort. We're going to do a circuit walk, as we have done for other circuits. Uh, which means that we are going very slowly around the track. We're going to get our, uh, uh, find the lines, the correct lines, find the reference points for when to start braking, when, when to turn in, and when to start accelerating. Uh, as usual, I believe this is one of the best exercises you can do uh, to learn a track and to understand how to drive the car uh, into a track. And then it can also help you when you are racing because if you have good reference points you can also use them you know or find new reference points uh for you know attacking for defending and so on um <laughs> so let let me check um uh let me check a little bit the uh the chat and see how you guys are doing i can already see many people uh coming in so good news, very good news. Now, if we finish, uh, you know, the uh, the circuit walk a little bit early, and I'm still, you know, in good shape, uh, we can try and do some theory uh, lessons. I would like to talk to you about uh, load uh, um, uh, weight shift and load shift, and you know. Uh, make the difference and understand the difference between those two things, uh, weight transfer and load transfer, and how it works. Because last time we talked about uh, the pores, and I've seen, I've watched the uh, video again, and to be honest, uh, my explanation was really, really terrible. Uh, hopefully we didn't stay there. Uh, luckily we didn't stay there for a long time, but it's not something that I like to have online to explaining how weight transfer and load transfer works. So I've thought about it and I've said, okay, we, if we have time tonight, we're going to try it. If we don't have time tonight, we're going to try it a different day. Um, uh, Tony, mi spiace, non ho, non, ho, non ho i settaggi per T500, non, non so cosa dirti. Uh, mi spiace. Um, Scalda, non, scalza, probabilmente non hai il giusto numero di gradi, probabilmente. Uh, boh. All right, so. Um, Rafael, I have no idea about that. I have no, no idea, but, you know, it's tomorrow, so it's going to be for uh, at least some days, so if it's any uh, special uh, sales from our part, I guess we will all see it tomorrow, so. Uh, news on GT4, um, maybe later I could tell you, I can only tell you, I cannot, you know, show you anything. I could tell you a little bit about the GT4s. Uh, I think it's going to be great racing cars. They are both much easier and much more difficult to, to, to race, uh, to drive. Uh, I believe you will enjoy them a lot. Uh, I think it's uh, very, very nice uh, stuff. When? I don't know, but I think very, very soon. All right, so um, what can we do? Let's, uh, let, let me just tell to the people probably at Facebook, you know, that were waiting probably for the, uh, for the live stream that we changed <clears throat> the, uh, the link. So um, where is this? Copy link. 
and let me go for a moment to Facebook. Oops, where am I? I don't even know where I'm going and what I'm doing. Just a second, guys. I'll be right away with you. Live stream here. Boom, boom. Okay. All right. So let's go back. Um, no, we are not going to update Zandvoort to 2020, um, 2020 season because the cars haven't raced over there. And so the, the, the simulator is still for 2019. So I don't know what's going to happen in 2020. So it's, it's a difficult year. I mean, even Formula One code master said that they won't update for new circuits for the, uh, 2020 season. So. Uh, manufacturers, yes, they have stopped harassing me about BOP. They will start again as usual, but later on, probably if we do something similar. But yeah, 705 hours of ACC. Well done, Ralph. Okay, so um, let's go. Let's go back into the game. And as usual, let's go to practice here and pick uh, Zandvoort, right? Where is it? Sunboard. Here it is. Nice. And our trusty uh, Porsche that we tried the last time. Possibly something nice. Uh, we've got GPX. Nice. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Alto. What, what is an Alto? You mean the Suzuki Alto, mate? <laughs> Okay. Well, Nicole, this, yeah, I could must have put the 2020 layout probably because, you know, they did it for Formula One, but the GT3 cars never raced on that. So at least up, up to 2019. So, uh, this, it should be written, Raphael, on the multiplayer. It should be written somewhere in the server description, I think. Okay, so let's go in. Uh, the BOP doesn't get updated very often. Actually, not at all. Uh, we do some fine tuning if we see big issues or small updates or if you get new data. If we get new data, obviously, we put them in and we try to uh, you know, improve the car. Or maybe the car even gets, maybe it will get even worse, but new data is new data, so we'll put them in. So, no, we don't really update the BOP a lot and very often. Maybe once every uh, big update. But again, it's not a big update of the BOP. The BOP is already known at the start of the, of the year. And we just go and see that if one car is too fast on a certain track, we try to understand what went you know, wrong and see if we miss something and fine-tune small details here there that, you know, in, in a set of course competition, the BOP is so close that we saw with the SRO uh, eSport uh, races that we had like, in pro, we had like 25 to 28 drivers with different cars all within a second. Not even in the rear races, something like that happens. Uh, and in the silver, we had up to 35 drivers in, the, in a single second. I know that people will start saying, oh, but in that race, that car was much faster. Or in that other race, the other car was much faster. No, it wasn't. It was just, you know, a couple of tenths faster. And obviously, they probably had also on that car the best drivers for the circuit, for the car, because also that changes. And they managed to dominate. But truth to be told is that from the first car to the 35th uh, car on the grid, they were all in a single second. So that, that's, for me, that was a big surprise. It was pretty amazing. I, I mean, I knew it was pretty well balanced, but I wasn't expecting that close of a result. So, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty satisfied with that. Uh, <laughs> easy. Yes, yeah, Suzuki Alto. <laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, 
big difference between the layouts of the trucks you mean in terms of uh, years? Uh, not really, pretty much all the trucks are the same. The biggest difference is uh, Silverstone. 2018 has a much faster asphalt because it was just like a week or two weeks uh, of new asphalt uh, when the cars went to race in 2018. 2019 is the same circuit, but the asphalt was already one year older. So you are about two seconds slower in uh, Silverstone 2019. Uh, I think it is um, half a second slower Barcelona 2019. And maybe something also for Ricard, and that's it. Nothing else. Uh, well, the SRO, uh, the whole league organization, decided to boot Balas in order to give you know uh, everybody a chance to be competitive. Uh, in, in sim racing, it's a little bit different than uh, real racing. In real racing, you have for the sprint, uh, um, you know, for the sprint races, you have limited tire sets, uh, one hour of race with driver's walk. For the endurance uh, races, you have at least three hours of racing, again, limited tire sets. In sim racing, everybody gets a car that thinks that it is just, you know, one tenth of a second faster than the others, and then they keep you know, practicing, 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 unlimited laps, unlimited laps. So what happens is that uh, the gap between that car and the other cars that they are, they are less used, you know, it grows. It grows up to two tenths, three tenths, four tenths of a second. Uh, so this happens in sim racing. And of course, those cars have a BOP for, you know, a three hours race while we put them, you know, racing unlimited tire sets in one hour race. So... The fear was, okay, that some cars might have been, you know, faster than the other ones. And they decided, I think I was, I, will, I also agreed with that, uh, to put a ballast for the winning cars so that, you know, on the next race, they had the ballast and other cars could, you know, uh, be more competitive. And I think, honestly, it worked pretty much very, very well. So I know that, obviously, the guys that, you know, won and got the ballast, they were complaining and all of that, and blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And, but, I mean, it goes like that for everybody. And if you got the ballast, it means that you have dominated the, the race before, so you got, you got the, uh, the points, you know? Um... Claudio, thank you so much. Congrats to Kevin and Davide. Also, big, big congrats to Gergo, who was behind the scenes working like crazy. Uh, Federico Sara from uh, Akapa Informatica also working like crazy. Uh, the guys behind uh, Akapa Informatica who organized the whole thing also worked very, very nicely. Uh, the SRO organization also supported us with the, he, their commentators and everything. I mean, really congrats. And of course, congrats to Race Department for organizing the rest of the races for the AAM Championship and also that. So there are so many people that really, really work their asses out. I mean, Really hard work, lots of stress. Uh, at the same time, we also had different things to deal with. Really hard. So, big applause, congrats to all of them. <laughs> um, any more trucks coming? Yes, we are preparing the British GT trucks. Uh, I think there are three uh, British GT trucks amongst other Ulton Park, Donington Park. Really fantastic trucks. Um, Right, so just one thing, I might, you know, uh, tell it again for the guys, I understand. So, for the guys with the console version that they are on the chat and asking for it. Well, first of all, I am not a support guy and I cannot give you support possibly because otherwise I, would be, I wouldn't be doing those videos. I'm doing the physics and I'm doing the physics on the PC and making sure that the physics on the console are the same. Uh, so, that is my job. I cannot give you support, guys. I can tell you this, okay? Okay. Uh, if you're seeing on the videos, people like Zardier, uh, Game Tech UK, um, I mean, all today there was uh, um, uh, Jimmy Broadband, P P Punterino, <laughs> all right. Uh, all those guys, they are trying the console version. They have no issues with, you know, uh, force feedback and stuff like that. And they, you know, confirm that the fixes are the same. Uh, what does that mean? It means that if you have 
problems with your steering wheel, then there is some kind uh, of unfortunate configuration problem. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it means that you need to do something with your steering wheel, either the degrees of rotation, either, I don't know, take it off and on the uh, console again. It, there might be some kind of configuration combo with a bug on, on the software that doesn't let the two things work. Uh, but as you can see, when it works, it works properly. So if you cannot make it work, something is amiss, okay? So try a little bit. Obviously, uh, 505 Games and D3T, which is the company, uh, the software company, the developers that made the um, conversion into the consoles, they are listening. They have made uh, um, a new uh, specific page uh, to collect all your reports and uh, bugs, if any, and they are trying to you know, figure out what is going on. So if you have any problems like that and you cannot you know, pull it through and find the solution, then by all means go here into this link, uh, link for console uh, support, uh, write down you know, everything you need, uh, and rest assured that those guys are listening and working you know, to, to find out what's going on. Uh, but again, I'm telling you, yesterday we had more people on the console lobby playing actively all night than on the PC lobby, which means that, you know, the game luckily works. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so if you have a problem, I'm very, very sorry about it. I cannot give you support because I don't even have a console, so to say. And obviously it's not my job. Uh, so go there and uh, uh, just write down everything you need or at least, you know, try some solutions, go to the forums, ask about it, and so on. Um, all right, so. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have a Discord server. I'm, 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 guys, I, I, need to, I need to work during the day on the simulator that you all love. <laughs> I cannot do everything, you know. So I, can, I, I do what, whatever I can. All right, so, so should we start? Okay, so let, let's, let's uh, start our, um, our nice little... Um, uh, circuit work, right? Yeah, circuit work. Hey, Q8 Scuderia from Kuwait, really? Thank you so much for, for joining. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, so let's go. Let's do just one lap. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the reviewer is trying to say competizione is really, is really funny. <laughs> uh, Snetterton, yes, I think I think we have Snetterton. I think we're gonna have Snetterton for the British GT, um, you know, um, DLC, which is coming either uh, at the end of this year or at the start of uh, next year. Forgive me, but I don't remember the the titles of the um, of the um, of the circuits because obviously we are now at least on my side. I'm extremely focused on GT Force and console and uh, SRO just before that. So ah, I can tell you it was one of the most <laughs> crazy two or three months of my life. <laughs> I mean, it was. Unbelievable what was happening behind the scenes. <laughs> All right, so easy little uh, lap. So let's do Let's go to the straight line and start our circuit walk. Now, well, first of all, I think we should make sure that you guys can uh, can see the uh, mouse because otherwise uh, you won't be able to, to see whatever I'm showing to you. All right, so uh, let me know in a minute if you can see the mouse. I will leave it here 
on the uh, this circle that you see in the rev uh, HUD. Okay, so as fast as possible, obviously on the uh, straight line of uh, Zandvoort, which is also really a very very short straight line. Uh, at least you're coming from almost a flat out with many cars flat out uh, very wide uh, turn so you know the top speed is low but not that low uh, that's something um, but yeah so um, uh, PUs we didn't have any crashes on are you talking about PC or console I don't know Okay, you can see the mouse, very good. So, you are arriving at full speed uh, and your first uh, reference point to start braking is either this billboard here, you know, Tarzan for the famous uh, T1, and uh, either that or this line, white line and red line on the asphalt. It's a very, very good... Uh, you see, you, you practically you have a specific place where you can start braking. Now, getting better and better and better, you will start braking a little bit later uh, than, um, than this uh, line. Uh, but, you know, for starters, uh, just go with, uh, with this line and you should be, you should be fine. Uh, let me check that everything is correct here because... Uh, all right, okay, so now it works again. Right, so... Again, let me show you from the outside. This is the line. As soon as you go over the line with your car, uh, or even a little bit sooner at the start of, uh, of your laps when you are exploring your car and your circuit, uh, this is the place to start braking uh, uh, for the T1. Right, so, um, as wide as possible, as usual. Okay. Now, as you can see, this turn has an incredible amount of camber, which really helps with, you know, lateral grip. Uh, and it also can help you with uh, your braking distance. Now, the, the, the trick here is not staying as wide as possible for the whole braking zone and then go in, but start going in just a little bit sooner, uh, practically arriving here, you see, at this... Uh, angle of the white internal line and making something like a very early first apex okay so very early first apex you're still going to keep breaking here uh, it's good to you know give it a little bit more extra steering uh, into this uh, situation because the extra camber helps you to bring the car in keep on modulating the, uh, the braking uh, force uh, this is a turn that you can use a lot of trail braking. Uh, you might end a tiny bit wide, but don't overdo it. Because if you overdo it, you're going to end up uh, way too wide and to the dirty and marbles part of the asphalt. So let me show you from the outside. You see, so you can go a little bit wide like this, which is almost, you know, a car uh, width. Uh, from the from the uh, curb and then you need to go back again okay don't go too wide because as you can see there is plenty of marbles you are not anymore on the rubber line here and so you're gonna lose grip so just a little bit and then instantly in again okay so of course don't touch the curb as Claudio very well s says because you know it's a smooth curb but very very high so it will totally unbalance uh, your, uh, your your car uh, keep going and uh, practically uh, um, because of as we said this this turn is uh, has a lot of, uh, of camber and it helps you with lateral grip uh, I'm starting to accelerate uh, more or less when those billboards here, you can see the billboards, when I see the billboards end, you know, they go past away from my um, left uh, roll bar here. When they go past away, I'm already on the accelerator and start accelerating. This is my reference point for the acceleration uh, out of the T1. 
all right now t1 you can also use this uh, uh this curve at the exit don't go too wide because as you see it narrows more and more and uh, outside the uh curb you have sand which obviously it's gonna unbalance the car but most importantly will slow you down uh, it's not a good thing to go there um, so stay careful don't go over there and get into the uh, asphalt as soon as possible on to the asphalt again following the circuit here is no big deal and now we approach this really hard t3 they call it because this one also they call it t2 but so it's the third uh, uh band of the circuit now when to start breaking for this uh band uh you can see here there is no real um uh, there's no real reference point here there's no easy uh, reference point because um, normally uh, you should start breaking somewhere here but there's no real reference point so what you want to do is keep an eye on the end of the curb here and break before that right before that now obviously some of you people might say well i will start breaking somewhere around here where i see uh the rubber line starting you know uh being visible as usual i never advise you to follow the rubber line because you can see it now but if the track is green or fast or it starts race, race, uh, raining, you won't be able to see the rubber line. So take reference points that they are fixed and you know that you can always you know, count on them. Not take reference points that they can change uh, depending on the meteor, you know, weather conditions uh, or, I don't know, the sun shadows or stuff like that. Don't take such reference points. Um, so what to do as i said this is more or less the breaking point here uh keep an eye on the end of the curb on the outside curb and break before that uh, obviously start breaking way before that uh, and slowly go closer and closer but pr it's practically impossible to break exactly at the end of the curb so always break a little bit sooner all right So, um, you break here, you start going inside the turn. Now, be very, very careful. It's easy to rotate the car here in the entry with trail braking, and you need to do so. But if you overdo it, as you can see, this curb here is really, really very high, and you really don't want to, uh, you know, go up this curb because uh, the speed is medium speed turn uh, it's over a crest uh, you certainly don't want to make the car jump you're gonna lose it you're gonna end up on the wall because as you can see the wall here is very very close uh, or you're gonna spin or best case scenario you're gonna lose lots of time so don't go over this curb you have to be very careful and precise uh, to do the turn properly if you have rotated properly the car during the turning then again at the end of those build parts here you can see the billboards that they end here. When you see the billboards ending close to your roll bar, this is the uh, correct uh, place to, you know, go into the accelerator again and start accelerating outside the uh, the turn to the exit. Um, there is no practically no curb at the exit here, and the curb there is here is also it also has steps. So I highly advise you to not really use uh this this curve because as you can see if you go here then you know the suspension starts moving around the car already is very very loaded to the outside wheels because you are sliding a little bit towards the outside and if you go over the curves you will totally you know jump and go outside and when you go outside here um you're gonna lose traction you're gonna lose even uh, you know uh, balance of the car you might even you know uh touch uh the the curb with the under tray of the car and it's really really tricky and very dangerous thank you mtf dark eagle and croon loon and uh funny italy and everybody else for the subscription okay so don't do this you see i can't even go back now um some people try to go outside to go as right as possible and then go into the turn um 
I usually don't do this. I'm staying around here. For me, it feels pretty much the same uh, speed. Um, try whatever you think it works. Okay, try the one way, try the other way, and see how it works for you. Uh, usually, I think that if I stay here, I have a better possibility to, you know, break sooner and be able to break into a straight line. So when to break? Uh, I start breaking again at the end of this billboard or if the tires are fresh and you know the car has low fuel etc I will start break my braking zone at the end of the Assetto Corsa Competizione um, publicity here so either here or here depending how much I want to push my uh, braking zone so keep an eye on the left as soon as you go over that start braking break really hard this is a first gear turn and again you want to stay as you can see there is lots and lots of cumber and you want to stay inside and keep the car inside um, uh, as much as, uh, as possible um, to exit the turn we have a very very nice um, uh, reference point and as usual, it's uh, the end of uh, the side wall, and this time is also orange. We always know that when we see orange somewhere in the guardrails or you know a, a safety uh, wall like that, uh, it's usually a pretty good uh, reference point to uh, keep an eye for. Uh, now, normally you might find that the car can accelerate sooner, but the problem is that uh, the rod starts to go uphill. And not only it goes uphill, but it also loses the camber. So if you start accelerating sooner here, you might end up with power on understeer. And that will bring you, you know, wide and you won't be able to push the car in. You will be forced to, you know, raise your foot from the accelerator. And raising the foot from the accelerator means that you lose accelerator for the uh, long uh, acceleration straight that follows. So... Have a little bit of patience, maybe stay on the accelerator steadily, but don't go full on it. And when you arrive here and you go through the orange uh, safety wall on your, on your uh, right, then full on acceleration and the car should be able to follow the line. You see how it goes uphill and there is no uh, camber anymore. Actually, the camber go goes negative. So this always pushes the cars, you know, outside and uh, you, you end up with uh, track width in no time at all. So a little bit of patience, wait for the orange uh, safety wall, and then accelerate. Right, so let me check uh, until now. Uh, let me check the chat and see if you guys are okay with that. Let's see if there are any questions about it, and then we continue. Right, so... Um, hmm. How can you play with friends in ACC, uh, Daniel Torino? Sorry, I cannot. I cannot really talk about that. We are doing things about physics and driving into my uh, into my videos. I cannot help you with that. What I can tell you is probably if you have friends into the PlayStation or Xbox system and you press quick join and they are already somewhere in the server, usually the quick join tries tries to put you inside the server with friends. Uh, I'm not sure if that already works in the console but usually how that's how uh, it works up until we don't create uh, we don't release the private lobbies which are already uh, in um, you know they're, they're working with um, uh, Rafael Teixeira says it's important that reference points change a little bit with different camera settings uh, FOV uh, and distance this is very true Keep that always in mind. Those things work for my settings, you know. Um, if you have changed your FOV or something like that, uh, the reference points are still pretty much the same, but they do change a little bit, especially when you, you know, expect them to, 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 to start the braking or to start the acceleration. For, for example, if you have three screens, you might not want to see something passing through the first roll bar, but maybe a little bit, uh, later but you know those are the reference points you can just find out how to combine them with what you're seeing on your screen um, uh, 
Uh, Maurizio Mano says, question about lines in turn four. I try to stay wide in the middle and try to take a late apex because this lets me have more straight front uh, tire and uh, more easier full gas. Is this an error? Absolutely not. This is also a very good um, line to get. Just be careful, don't go too wide because you're going to you know, lose some time and you're going to end up to the track that is not rubber and you're going to lose some grip. But if you do it properly, this is again a perfect line, probably even better than what I just saw. Um, uh, DXT Ely, uh, when I'm braking, says, when I'm braking, uh, I get a snap oversteer. Is that about my setup or driving? Well, you're bats in luck because the last video I just made, you know, uh, public, uh, it was a, a big live stream, but I make a shorter card, still one hour long. I just made it public today, uh, earlier uh, this day, and talks exactly about that. It's, it talks about how you can understand if it is a problem of your car and how to cure it, or if it is a problem of your driving style. So I advise you go and watch. I know it's one hour and 20 minutes, but I think it is a, it is a video that if you watch it carefully, it's gonna, you know, explain you many, many things about that, and you probably going to understand how to deal with such situations. Um, right. Uh, Novothy, uh, seven, uh, seventy, Novo, uh, Mr. Novotny, uh, seventy-two. Uh, ask what kind of resolution and uh, FOV I use, etc. Please ask me again after we finished uh, the uh, sit will walk, and I will tell you and I will show you. Um, when the ray comes, the trajectories are a little bit different. Again, we have a video about that, but let's talk about it later. All right. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on. Let's move on. So now this is practically a straight. Actually, it's not a straight. There are lots of bends here, but you can get them all flat out. It is important to use as little steering input as possible, because less steering input at high speeds means a more stable car and obviously less scrub from the tires, which means you ruin your tires much less, your tires will last longer, and most importantly, you don't scrub speed from your acceleration because the higher speed you have and the more you scrub with your tires and the more the acceleration is slower because the tires create rolling resistance, uh, create uh, lateral forces, and don't let you know your, your engine to accelerate fully. So uh, let's move on. Again, here you can just you know go over this white uh, part here but don't touch uh, the grass <coughs> stay as <coughs> sorry stay as uh, right as possible and then again as little steering input as possible and go in this is one of the first tricky corners it's not really tricky you can easily do it flat out okay but the less steering wheel you're using as we said less consumption on your tires and more um, acceleration you have it is also very, very important to do this turn and uh, stay, you know, as left as possible because the next turn is a tricky turn. Uh, and it is a tricky turn because uh, you really need to get the perfect line out of this turn. Uh, I advise you to go and uh, watch my... Uh, today, uh, my, my live stream of from the uh, last Friday or the video that I've posted today where we did some fast laps uh, into the circuit. Um, you need to take this line perfectly. Usually, uh, the perfect line is somewhere around here when you are just touch, you know, this uh, curb uh, at your right. Okay, so let's have a look at that. You see, I'm already touching way too much. You, you have to even less than this, okay, even less than this. Just touch it, and uh, you really need to approach this. You see here, now, this um, uh, this bump that we just went through, which is quite a big bump, all right? You can see here again, boom. You see, this one. Now, this bump here 
can really, really unbalance your car, especially if your car is a little bit soft and touches the ground when you are passing through this at over 200 kilometers per hour, you are still turning, you are going over a crest, and while you're doing so, the car touches the ground. This is very bad. So obviously you're going to say, what is that? Is that a bug because it's so big? No, this is actually you know, a proper uh, bump on the real uh, road. Uh, David Perel gave us lots of um, feedback about that. He actually told us, uh, you know, when when you are going over that bump, you think that the whole car is going to explode because it's so hard and you are going so fast over it and you have so much downforce pushing down that the car goes over and it's like, bam, and everything. I mean, it's, it's really a terrible sensation. And you have to, you know, put your keep your, your, your foot on, on the accelerator and keep on going flat out. And you can see, you know, the road uh, going uphill and then over the crest and downhill again. And it really is very, very scary, especially when it rains. So you have to go over that with as little steering input as possible, stable car, not having the car, you know, sliding around. And if you do everything correctly, you're going to end up here very, very wide this outside curb is where you want to have your, your uh, vision pointed, looking forward and uh, way ahead from behind while you're still, you know, turning. And then you want to have your car practically straight and you're steering also straight while you're starting, starting going down, downhill, all right? So you're starting going downhill and now it's getting even more trickier than before. Um, so, again, the end of, roll bar, of uh, guardrail here, orange painted, it's our friend. This is your reference point. You are going past through this and you start braking in uh, fifth gear or fourth, fourth gear, I don't remember right now. And you want to, you know, downshift. When you are getting more and better, uh, you have more practice with your car and this uh, track. Uh, you will start, you know, breaking after that uh, orange guardrail. This side road is also a very good um, reference point. Uh, I'm not telling you to start breaking on this side road, but at least a little bit behind it, right? But between the orange end of the guardrail and that uh, side road, that's the perfect place to start breaking really heavy at first and then really modulating your steering wheel and your braking force, you know, you have to really modulate them because this is a very, very high speed turn. It is going downhill. We know that those cars are extremely pitch sensitive, so the car will start, you know, moving around. So you need a setup that will support you. It doesn't go instantly into an oversteer because it's too much pitch sensitive. And you also want smooth uh, steering inputs to initiate the rotation, the turn in, and you also want very fast steering inputs if you feel that the car is going way too much out of balance, so you need to, you know, counter steer and go back again as fast as possible. Remember, when you are counter steering for oversteer, don't wait for the car to get a set and then go back again. It's too late. It's going to slap you and you're going to end up on the other side. So you go in like that, okay? The car starts rotating way too much, so you need to counter steer. You counter steer and instantly going back again. And again, if it's if it needs a second time, it's better than, you know, just going there and waiting. Okay, 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 I'm sliding, waiting, waiting, waiting. Okay, now I have grip again. Let's move way too late. Slaps and you go to the other side. So that's why you see also real drivers that they are doing stuff like, like that. Okay, and you say, why did he do that? I mean, I didn't see any movement. They do this because they know. The car starts rotating. You feel it also, okay? Counter steer and go back again. Counter steer and go back again. Very fast. You don't have to wait. What you're doing when you're doing fast is you are moving ahead of what the car is going to do. Don't wait for the car, for the car to do the, its stuff, but move ahead of the car, right? Okay, so still we're still braking here. We're going inside the turn. Usually the brake is more or less up to this point where you can see here this semaphore for the uh, yellow uh, flags or something like that. 
Uh, so usually you, you, you keep braking and, you know, dozing and modulating your brake, brake force up to the semaphore. Then you have some phase that you are coasting. And while you are approaching the uh, curb here, before, after it, depends on your car setup, your practice, your driving style, whatever. Uh, this is where you want to go on the accelerator hard. Uh, and possibly the car will help you, will rotate a little bit with power, and you're going to end up here. Once again, don't go very wide, because as you can see, uh, the curb is stepped, which means the tires will start, you know, hopping and uh, jumping, and it very, very brutally ends uh, the curb here. So you really need to stay up to the white line and not farther away. Uh, sometimes you need to go over that, but, you know, be prepared. Uh, sometimes it's even better, you know, when you're, when you see that you have no possibility to keep the car inside the asphalt, to go wider, put your tires into this uh, cement, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then go back again. It's going to be wild, it's going to be bad, but you're probably going to save the car. Okay, so, um, move on, we keep on going, keep the car as left as possible. Now, you can see here, again, we have no real reference points for the next turn, okay? But you have uh, the left side of the rod making a little bit of a kink here, a little bit of an angle. You can see this, there's an angle here, right here. So this is your reference point to start braking. So you have to watch that, you know, angle uh, from, from way behind. Your, your eyes have to be, you know, over there. And once you arrive here, you start braking hard, shift down to third gear. And now you want to rotate the car and move the car up into this curb. Now, watch carefully. You need to take the curb, but not too much. Why? Because the curb has an extra curb <laughs> exactly on the apex, all right? Hello, understeer me up, welcome. You see that? Now that's an extra curb that, you know, goes up like this. And if you take it, the car will hop and jump and you're gonna lose a lot of time. You're, you're gonna go uh, extremely off, off balance and you don't, you don't wanna happen. Uh, you don't want this to happen. So what you want to do is, you want to be in a situation like this. Let me show you. Now, this is the ideal situation you want to, to be with. Okay, So you have practically the car rotated. Now, the car slides towards the outside. And you want your front inner wheel, which is practically almost on the air because you have already stepped up on the first you know, lower uh, curb right here. You see it's a little bit lower. Okay, so the, the front inner wheel is practically almost on the air. So it can get uh, the, the slight bump of that first part of the extra curb without upsetting too much the car. Okay, so you want the car to be in a slight oversteer. You're going to touch a little bit the curb with your, your, you, with your inner front uh, wheel and the car will keep rotating under acceleration. You want to be already in acceleration when you are here, and it will slide out, and hopefully everything will be fine. Uh, it sounds extremely complicated. It is extremely complicated, but with practice, we know we can do it. So keep on practicing. This is how we want to, uh, to do this kind of turn. So again, you are going to slide in a control oversteer outside. Uh, don't go over this curb again. Once again, as you can see, the curb is stepped. Uh, you're going to jump and go out to, to the grass, which is very slippery. So you need to do everything properly and end up here still on the tarmac. All right. Now, the next turn is very tricky and strange. Actually, normally it's a very simple turn. You just brake. Okay. Go in. It's a slow turn not much to do it seems to have enough grip but to take it fast enough it's trickier than it sounds and at the same time if you do it properly 
it's much faster than it seems and even easier than it seems. So what do you need to do? Um, you need to keep on going here and start breaking just a little bit be before that uh, billboard with the name of the turn. Uh, so you start breaking here. Now, I've seen many people going inside the turn sooner, which means that they end up on the turn somewhere like this here. Okay? And they are like here. Now, if you are in this position, somewhere here, okay, if you are like this, then this turn becomes extremely slow. You have to slow down the car a lot. While slowing down, you have to brake, so there's lots of understeer going in, and you have to be slower and slower and slower. And either they manage to slow the car and they are very slow at the apex, or they just, you know, slide with understeer to the outside, and then they have to wait before rotating the car and going out again. But, but here's what you can do. Now, if you look at this turn from way ahead like this, you see. Now, from the inside of, of the car, it seems like a 180 degrees turn. But if you look at it from the outside like that, you see that it's a little bit more than 90 degrees practically. Uh, so, if you stay a little bit wide here, and then release the brakes and go smoothly into the apex and out again like this here. Here, the turn is not so narrow anymore and you can accelerate. It's practically it's ended. Even if it's going still around, you can still be in uh, full throttle. And this turn becomes something like 90, 95, 100 degrees turn. And it can be much, much faster than what you have thought uh, it would be. So. The idea here is, you know, you brake in a straight line like this, you release your brakes and start going in, okay? Now, most people, as we said here, they keep on turning more. When you are arriving at the apex, start, you know, going outside. Even if you looking that, oh my God, I'm going to end up completely outside. Now, here's the trick. If you keep going outside like this, you see, the turn itself widens up, okay? Uh, and so you end up with your steering wheel having much less steering angle than what you have anticipated. And it's much easier to push on the accelerator, full throttle open, and complete the turn much, much faster than before. Okay. So you need some extra practice on this turn to understand how to do it. But once you grab the, the fact that it is a much wider turn than, it, than what it seems when you are approaching, and it also opens up at the exit uh, while it's still, you know, the bend keeps going, but it's much wider. The uh, radius is much uh, wider so that you can, you know, keep on going. Then this turn becomes much easier than, than it seems. Um, now, next turn. Next turn is very tricky for me. Uh, I'm still having issues. Uh, I'm managing, but I'm having issues. So, as usual, I'm trying... Now, I have some people going way outside. Uh, one very nice guy on the, um, on the comments uh, told, me, told me that uh, I was doing it pretty much properly, which means stay more or less at the center of the road. <clears throat> Sorry again. Um, don't go way too much on the outside. Uh, because you're going to lose time, you're going to do much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more meters. Uh, so stay on the middle of the road. Uh, once again, we have here uh, the orange um, guardrail. This is your reference points or a little bit before that, you know, uh, start braking really, really hard. S brake really, really hard because this turn seems to be Fast. It seems to be similar to the turn before, okay, but in reality it's even slower at the apex. So you have to brake really hard. You have to keep braking and rotating the car while going in like this, and you see it keeps on going more narrow. So you really have to be patient here. Right here you have to be patient. Don't, don't go on the accelerator because if you go on the accelerator, well, first of all the camber is strange 
and two things is, are going to happen or you're going to have big understeer and you're going to end up so wide that you will either either be forced you know to release your uh, pressure on the accelerator and you're losing time uh, or you're going to end up you know outside on the grass uh, or depending on the car you might get lots of uh, power over steer and you're going to end up at the exit with the car sideways or almost sideways but still you know lots of traction control intervention which means you are slower and slower so a little bit of patience okay when you see either the end of the curb or those um, tracks here this is the time to start applying throttle don't apply the throttle like this instantly go in a much more uh, controlled way uh, you have to be you know more uh, progressive in applying throttle here and start you know accompanying the car uh, straightening the the steering wheel and going outside like this once again another stepped uh, curb here don't go over here really really probably this is the worst of, of all of them uh, if you go over here you're certainly gonna end up way wide here uh, into the grass into into the uh, sun trap so again don't touch this this curb is really nasty okay so let's uh, move on now obviously full throttle here full throttle now first indication that you are arriving at the second is straight the first line we don't want to do anything at all into this uh, line yet so full throttle again second line this is where you should start considering braking uh, if it is the first times that you are you know practicing on the circuit then start braking exactly at the white line the better you you become the more you see that you can you know start braking much much later even just before the start of the curb but to do so you need to become more precise on entering the first part of the narrow chicane here uh, so start with the white line on the road and then slowly move forward your braking uh, point to around the 100 meter or just before uh, you know the um, uh, the start of, of the curb don't go exactly at the start of the curb because you won't made it uh, but somewhere around here you also have this uh, billboard here as another reference point so you have plenty of reference point for the first part of the chicane uh, breaking as straight as possible right as straight as possible turning in no big issues you can go over the curb but as you can see again it is another uh, typical uh, curb of uh, Zandvoort which means that you have the first part here that it is uh, pretty low and no big deal but the second part is even higher so I do not uh, advise you to go over that second part once more just put your tires touching the start of this extra curb and uh, you're good to go so let's see this just go over here over the first part of the curb touching the second one and as soon as you are here your foot can go on the accelerator again hard accelerate just a little bit you know there's no much space but you can really go hard with the accelerator and then again instantly hard on the brake again and you're ready for the next part now the next part as you can see there is lots of camber that will help you keep the car inside uh, in the inside of uh, of the turn but you don't want to go over the green stuff uh, because as you can see there are those very high uh, yellow sausages as we as we tell them uh, you don't want to you don't want to go over that some people do go over that uh, but the car keeps on jumping the um, traction control engages I, I don't advise you I think you are faster if you stay down over here and it's much better uh, and you have much better control of your car so stay here stay close uh, and as you see either the end of the billboard or the orange guardrail depends 
again on your line your setup your car many many uh, things to consider but your reference point must be either this one or this one as soon as you go over this one or the uh, orange guardrail you start accelerating or here for example you start accelerating and you should be good to go outside without big deal now this is a tricky um, uh, curve now as you can see it's smooth it's a pretty smooth curve but this uh, strange curve is uh, actually like a a triangle a, a pyramid pyramid something like that okay it's it's like this which means that uh, either you really go outside you know like this okay you see already my my <laughs> my wheel was on the air my outside the wheel so either you go outside like this okay and hope for the better or okay or if you stay with the car in that situation let me try to maneuver my car like this okay somewhere around here that's pretty much the, the worst thing you can do why because obviously again depending on the car it means that your car is practically touching the ground right on the top of the pyramid of that that nasty little curb around here uh, keep in mind that right now we are stopped but remember when you are racing and you're going over that the whole car you know is ha has a roll towards the outside the suspension are lower that you have downforce so you're gonna scrap really badly with the under tray of your car and you you're gonna lose traction on on your tires and grip and the traction would control with uh, again engage you, you're gonna end up losing lots of time so uh, be careful uh, don't overdo uh, this uh, this curb uh, my advice is again to to stay in a situation more or less like this this is where you want to to be at most you know so just a little bit of over that will help you you know to man maintain the car in uh, the line and that's it okay down right to the other side left side of the road that's a very very nice turn we are approaching your reference point for start braking is again the yellow uh, the orange guardrail end of guardrail in orange uh, so once you are through the guardrail you will start braking third gear and inside lots of curb lots of uh, camber again from the road um, now it depends some people go really wild and go way over uh, that curb um, for me the best times the, the best laps I did into this circuit was by maintaining my inner tires on the red white curb and not going over the, uh, the curb stone here uh, cement uh, some people will even cut into that and even make better lap times than me it depends on your ability your setup your car whatever as I said usually my best situation is being somewhere around here okay and something like that so just you know touching the curbstones here the uh, the, the cement uh, this is the, the best position when I'm on the apex and then full throttle uh, the camber of the road will help you rotate the car and stay uh, properly outside wide no big issues here even if you go a little bit over the curb even if it's stepped you can you can handle it and on for the last turn now the last turn sometimes on some cars you can do it flat out again depends on your setup uh sometimes you can't uh, it depends but so let's see how we can deal with it and what to do when you cannot make it you know full throttle uh, easily thanks alex for the subscription so stay a little bit on the outside don't go instantly in okay obviously on the accelerator full throttle now start turning just a tiny bit later don't, don't go instantly in the inside because if you end up here 
then you really have to lift off. You need to go in just a little bit later and you need to be on the apex around here at the start of, uh, of the curve. Now, here's the situation. If you are already feeling understeer before arriving at the apex, it pretty much 99% of the nine times out of 10, you won't, you won't make it to the outside without lifting. So if you feel already un big understeer here and you feel the car sliding uh, wide, here's what you can do. Now, instead of you know keeping the accelerator down like this 100% as you are, you can modulate your accelerator. So just you know bring the accelerator to 80, 70%, right? So keep on the accelerator, but just you know raise a little bit, not by much, okay? 70, 80%, something like that. This will help the car, you know, re regain a little bit of pitch forward and not having, you know, the nose raised up. And putting the nose down will give you some extra downforce to help rotate the car. Uh, you can do this up until you arrive on the apex here. And when you are here at the middle of the curb, you can go flat out again and you will be able to make the, the, the turn. This only if you feel that you are in you ain't gonna make it but you still you don't want to lose lots of time by ending up very wide and having issues you know you have to lift properly and losing lots of time if you do that if you just lift lift a little bit uh you ain't gonna lose lots of time and especially in race conditions um it's not like you know you're gonna lose uh, 10 kilometers per hour so that the cars behind you will overtake you you can do that and you know once you feel the car properly rotated just step on it take the car outside and that's it that is uh, a lap at uh, zandvoort uh, we have our reference points we have our lines and uh, i hope that uh, you liked it and hopefully it will be useful for for you to to get better into this uh, pretty tricky circuit one of the most difficult circuits, uh, especially to race, because it never leaves you with, you know, some time to breathe and relax. And um, you are always turning, controlling, braking, accelerating, you're always doing something. And even at the main straight line, it's so short that you don't really have any time to, to, to relax into this uh, circuit. So this is it. So let's go back to the chat and see if you have uh, questions if something is happening or if everybody is uh, has fallen asleep and doesn't know uh, what i've been uh, talking about for the past one hour or so all right uh, let's see All right. Uh, Zakun, Zakun asks, uh, uh, he would like to ask for a cross platform. Have you got a cross, uh, cross platform in plants? Uh, second question is the, abil the availability to put servers on ARM architecture. Uh, Raspberry Pi, etc. Uh, we have no plans for cross-platform, mainly for big difference in frame rate, obviously, and in number of opponents. But also, the most important thing is that we first and mainly uh, develop for the PC version. And the PC version is always uh, some um, uh, some versions ahead. Uh, and then once we have the PC version, you know, stable enough. We take those versions and we submit to the consoles and usually it needs one to two weeks to pass the submission because, you know, Sony and Microsoft have to control the submission. And so it's always way behind it. Uh, we cannot afford to, to wait, you know, for months uh, without having stuff out on PC. Uh, it's, it's not how we work. It's not our uh, work workflow. Uh, so because of that, there are different versions between console and PC and crossplay is simply impossible. Um, ARM architecture, I highly doubt it. We can do something like that. Uh, again, if you don't know, if you are, you know, 
new to the Kuno Simulazioni development team and our simulators. We are an extremely small team uh, with all our developers and artists and everything, uh, counting cats and dogs and everything. We are about 20 people. Uh, we have to be very careful on where to you know, use our, our people and our developers and what to do first. So uh, I don't think we can do something about our architecture. Sorry about that. Um, will 60 FPS come to console? I have no idea about it. I mean, if we could do it in 60 FPS for the console, we would have already done it. If it's not at 60 FPS, and I remind you, it has to be stable 60 FPS. Otherwise, you know, the Sony and Microsoft will not accept it. Um, if we could, if we could have done it, we would have already done it. If it's not there, it means that for the amount of technology and calculations and all the stuff that we wanted to, to do, it was practically impossible. So it's 30 FPS right now. This is how it is. <laughs> Um, next gen consoles when we will get our hands on them uh, we don't have them we don't know how they are probably you guys know better what is are the specifications from us uh, when we will have the possibility to you know have a look on one of those then we'll see what we can do about it maybe I don't know I don't know the plan yeah for, right now there are no plans at all because we don't even know what's about it um, low F force feedback on console again the first speaker should be identical to PC again I will remind you uh, two things first of all I cannot do support for the consoles first of all I don't have a console here uh, I do the physics I do the physics on PC uh, I cannot do support because I don't have the time to do support for the consoles. As I said, again, let me uh, link uh, the page. Uh, 505 and D3T and our team have created a specific page for console support. You can go here, console support page, and you can write down bugs or problems or whatever, and they are listening and they are reading. Uh, if you don't have the same exact force feedback on the consoles, I remind you, people like uh, Zardier, um, uh, Jimmy Broadbind, uh, uh, David Perel, they tried it on the consoles. They have their videos online and they said the physics are the same. So if you don't have them and you have strange things, then probably, I say probably, something is wrong on the configuration of your steering wheel with the software now it works on them it doesn't work on you so i assume there might be some bug or some strange configuration combination that we have overlooked and doesn't work on you but i've also heard many people that you know they tried different things like you know attaching the steering wheel before and then playing the game or disconnecting the steering wheel and reconnecting it again and it started working. Another thing that I've seen many people, they had their steering wheel configured badly in wrong steering angle, steering lock uh, values, like 180 degrees. For a set of Corsa, you need, and competition, you need to have it at, at least, uh, you need to have it at 900 degrees. Some people are having success with 540 degrees, but you know, I'm telling you, put it at 900 de degrees, uh, I've seen on the Thrustmaster website uh, there is a combination of keys like something like options and some um, uh, arrow keys on the wheel and you will see the LED flashing differently for different uh, steering wheel rotations. So make sure you go and visit that, uh, find that uh, page and configure your wheel at 900 degrees and also 900 degrees inside the seam and you want to be sure that the virtual steering wheel and your real steering wheel, when you're you know, rotating like this at 90 degrees, you see it one on one. If the virtual steering wheel is behind or in front of your, uh, especially if it is in front of your normal steering wheel, there's something is really bad with the, with the real steering wheel rotation lock to lock, and you have to fix that. 
So I believe this is the main problem, and the other problem is some steering wheels and pedals, they are not getting um, uh, assigned for whatever reason, I don't know. Some people, again, having uh, success by disabling and, you know, switching off, switching on again, I don't know. Uh, I know that the guys 505 and D3T are watching and reading and they are collecting your reports and bugs on that page that I have posted. So make sure to go there and post what is going on and make sure to watch forums and see if you can, you know, uh, work around this, uh, this problem, this unfortunate problem. Uh, it's crazy. Consoles should be identical because, you know, we just connect a will and the consoles will be, but it seems that on some combinations, uh, they still want some fiddling around. Um, let me see lots of things here. Uh, yes, so uh, Mr. Novotny72 asks uh, uh, what is my resolution and my FOV? Uh, my resolution is very simple. You know, I have to work, so I have two computers here. Uh, I usually, you know, develop on, on a Mikitos because I like it, whatever. I know you haters, whatever, okay. But I like it, so I develop here on, on the other computer and I push the data on the PC and I'm driving on the PC, so I keep both computers, you know, clean from lots of stuff going on and each computer is focused on one single thing. Uh, because of that, though, I'm into a desk uh, so I can easily, you know, hop from this uh, rig to the normal uh, seat so I can go to the other uh, uh, monitor. And of course, on the desk, I can only have two monitors. There, One is big 27 inches, the other one is 24. So I have a 24 inch monitor in front of me, 1080 resolution and these are my view settings nothing really fancy 45 degrees fov um, everything else is practically default um, i usually i would like to use this kind maybe a little bit more back and more down uh, in terms of visual uh, because i have a real steering wheel in front of me but uh, because I'm doing, uh, you know, the live streams for you guys and I want to, uh, to, to help you guys to understand what I'm doing, uh, I'm using this, um, uh, th this uh, uh, visual which also shows, you know, the steering wheel moving around so that you can understand how much steering wheel I'm using. Because one of the most important things in the Soto Corso Competizione is to use the correct amount of steering lock. Don't overdo it because you're going to get a completely uh, flat force feedback response. Uh, you're going to ruin your tires very soon, and you're going to get much worse uh, uh, grip from the tires. So this is what I'm, I'm using. Okay, I hope that uh, you know, covers your, your question. Uh, let's go on. Uh, questions for dumpers and stuff like that. Well, I, have, I don't know if we have... Uh, well, my, my, my T-shirt is the usual one. I mean, everybody, probably you're new on the channel, so welcome. Uh, all the guys on the channel already know my T-shirts. This one says, uh, warning, may spontaneously talk about cars, which is what I do all the time, every time, every day. Uh, you know, my wife uh, is a saint and uh, all praise Ari's wife that she always let me talk about cars <laughs> all day long. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I do. I, I, just, I just love cars. I love cars. That's it. Um, uh, don't you get tired of working on the game during the day, then still working on the game again by streaming on the evening? Um, asks Claudio, uh, Claudio Alegria. Uh, nice uh, surname. Uh, I'm, I'm getting very tired physically. Physically, uh, it's really, it's a hard job. It's a hard job. You have to work on the numbers drive a lot, push the car to the limits, to change from car to another car, deal with the stress, with the deadlines, with people asking, with bugs, with sport, with, you know, people happy, people unhappy, emails, everything. It's, uh, you know, 
developing games, especially if you want to stay close to the community, it's a little bit of a stressful uh, job. Um, and I'm getting pretty tired. Uh, I also have to keep my, my, myself uh, in, in a good fitness. So I usually was going out and running long distances. But because of the long distances running and lots of work and, you know, lots of power uh, on, on the brake pedals and stuff, uh, I now have to deal with a big inflammation of my, on my hip uh, and I cannot run anymore and I have some constant, uh, not too high, but, you know, bad pain, but it is what it is. So, am I tired to go back during the night and doing the streams for with you. I'll tell you what, uh, because I'm working from home, I don't get to see many people. Actually, I don't get to see anybody except of, of, of my family. And I really like cars, as I said, I love cars and I like talking about cars and I like sim racing. And so, um, being able nowadays to do those streams, at least as long as I can you know, deal with it, uh, gets me back to the days when I was having fun with sim racing. I was having fun with the people that they are, you know, with, with sim racers. And so doing those live streams again and talking with you guys on the chat and explaining you things and taking back your answers and your feedback and, you know, talking about that, uh, it, it makes me happy. Uh, mentally, it lets me, you know, uh, enjoy the work that I am doing, because if you're only working on that stuff, uh, then you're probably going to lose your love about it because it becomes, you know, a pretty tiresome, tiresome work. So talking with you guys, uh, it really relaxes me. Uh, I mean, it, it gets me a little bit more tired physically, but mentally it's really relaxing. It, it, it helps me being happy about the, the stuff I'm doing again. And uh, actually, I have to thank you about that, guys, uh, about all of this, because uh, it's really great to, to you know, be able to, to do this with you guys uh, once uh, every week or twice every week. And the format that I have, I have chosen, you know, doing those live streams and then easily go into those live streams and cut them into small pieces and, you know, post them during the week. It's really easy for me. And as I said, it's relaxing mentally. Now, as usual, the next day, the morning, I'm like, oh, why I did this again till one o'clock in the night? But that's no big deal. I mean, I can deal with it. No, no, no big problems. Uh, the the mental health and uh, uh, and, and fun times. That's that's I think the most important stuff uh, into my lifestyle. Because as I said, I'm I'm not like into an office when I can go and talk with colleagues and have a coffee. I'm passing, you know. 10 hours of my day in front of two monitors, maybe some chat and dealing with it and that's it. Uh, you know, sad music, ah, sad developer, <laughs> but that's not really the case. But you do need some fun, you know, and this is most of the fun that I can have, <laughs> usually. Um, all right. <laughs> Uh, fast lap. No, I don't want to do fast lap tonight because we, we did and I have to do fast laps uh, the other day, Friday, I'm going to do, it's going to be in Italian guys because I want to do uh, an eight hours in an Italian championship. We're obviously going to explain some things also in English, but mainly the whole live stream will be in Italian and we're going to be practicing with the BMW M6 at Spa uh, Friday night. All right. <laughs> mm. All right, all right. Thank you all for the for the advice for the gym and the push-ups and stuff like that. Yes, I, I should start doing stuff like that. Uh, it was in the plans, but lockdown, COVID, and stuff like that. But we'll get out from from it, and uh, next year will be stronger than ever. Um, <laughs> okay, nice. We are developing right now the GT4 cars, the GT4 DLCs. Um, oh, Gasper, you are from Slovenia. Actually, I'm not Italian, I'm Greek, uh, but I live in Italy since uh, 1991. 
uh, I came here to study and then I just, you know, stayed here. Um, Gustavo Caranto, by, by the way, I, I, I don't have anything to show you. I don't know if I have any, uh, I don't have a replay here, so it's pretty, it's pretty sad that we don't have a replay, but at least, you know, something is moving around while we are talking and answering the questions. Uh, this is a high downfall setup. Again, uh, Michael Simpson, go to the video I just posted today. Let's see if I can find the, uh, uh, the link for you. Uh, highly recommended to see how we made the setup uh, for this car and this circuit, uh, and uh, uh, also how to create the setup uh, for yourself, you know, uh, I think it's uh, it turned out to be a very very good uh, video. So um, go here and see the setup, and you can also download the setup on the descriptions of uh, the videos. I also put the link where you can go and download the setups that I'm creating for each video. Um, Well, everything with those cars, uh, so Sunny Volpix says, how come having bump stop rates on 20 and changing to 19 or 21 under steer extremely badly? I did not expect one click in bump stop range to destroy a setup. Um, there's another video that I write in, that I have made, that explains uh, the operational window of the cars. It is very, very important to understand why those cars are extremely extremely sensitive and they have a very narrow uh, operation window of setup changes. Uh, it doesn't obviously, one click on the bump stop doesn't destroy the setups, but you do feel a lot of change. And usually if you want to do something small in the setup, don't change uh, the bump stop range, change one click on the bump stop rate maybe, or do something else. Maybe one click on the wheel rates or on, uh, on the anti roll bar or on the dappers. Bump stop range is a big change on the setup. Bump stop rate a little bit less, arms a little bit less, dampers, fine tuning and stuff like that. Um, why not GTE? Because we're doing SRO, it's just a single series uh, simulator. Um, uh, I don't know how you can export telemetry to Motec from the PS PlayStation 4. I don't know about that. I will try to find out if this uh, uh, feature is still there. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And how you can do it or if it's going to be there later. But I don't know about that. Sorry. Uh, and I simply don't know. Danny, we just said the t-shirt says, uh, warning, may spontaneously talk about cars. <laughs> you, you've missed it. Um, you used my setup for Bathrust from the Porsche 911. It's quite good. Very happy to hear that. Probably you're gonna need less wing uh, for Bathrust and a little bit of different, you know, uh, uh, bump stop settings and controlling uh, the aero platform because you have, you know, longer straights. But good that it works for you. Um, Hello, Thea! <laughs> Hello, Thea, how are you doing? Kalispera, uh, Yorgo. Okay, so... Um, okay, so... We have... I mean, it's, it's 11.40 minutes. It's late, but... Uh, we can try and uh, explain some tricky stuff for you, if you guys want. I would like to explain you... Uh, but to do so, I need, you know, to, to the chat to, to calm down a little bit with questions, because otherwise it's going to be difficult. Uh, B385 says AC1 was the most realistic production car simulator. Thank you about that. Uh, is there any plans to simulate road cars in the future? Who knows what the future will, will bring? I mean, no idea. I mean, we're talking future, you know, but I don't know. Uh, uh, Any time, no. I don't know. Uh, thank you, sorry. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Uh, enzyme maps are explained into the. Uh, there is a full post into the blogs. If you again, if you watch uh, the description of the videos, probably not this because when I'm starting the live streams, the description goes away and I have to uh, write it again. But go into one of the older videos, uh, even you know the last one, and in the description you will find the link to the official developers dev blogs into our official forums. Into that forum you will find a full post uh, about all the echo maps, all the engine maps for every car. So all the maps for all the cars, all of that is listed there uh, nicely and you can know what, uh, what to do. Um, which driver from <laughs> Gustavo uh, Sarantola, Sarantola, Carantola, sorry, sorry mate. Uh, which driver from all motorsport is your favorite? I don't really have favorite drivers because I have I, I love cars. I, I'm into the motorsport for the cars and for the engineering and for I mean since very small age I was watching you know Formula One or other uh, motorsport on the TV just to watch the cars moving around. I love seeing cars moving around. That's what I like. So yes, I have some. I mean I, I loved Mansell. I love I loved the lazy Zan lazy. And um, I like, I really like uh, Richardo, but I, I tend to like people that have a nice character and that are nice guys, you know. Um, that's it mainly. So, yeah, that, that's it. I'm, I'm not too much into, into people. I'm more into car. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a strange guy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, right. Oh, you're doing the 12 hours charity race, Teamuzad. Oh, that's great. That's going to be great. Uh, best of luck for that. You're going to be watching, <laughs> for sure. Um, you guys, you might want to post the link of that great uh, race. It's for charity. It's really good. So highly, highly recommended to watch it and hopefully donate if you can. Uh, let, me, let me see how, if I can find the, uh, the link, which is always a good thing. Uh, here it is. I think. Ah, uh, yeah, here it is. So here's the fundraising for the uh, 12 hours race. I think this is it. Okay. And um, for the stream and the race is... Yeah, the, 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 that's, that's the, the, uh, the charity stream. So... I don't have the exact link, so watch out for that. <laughs> Hello, Tetit. Hello, George. The Gregor, sorry. What do you think about the graphic engine and real engine? Well, it's powerful. Uh, it has advantages, big advantages. It has also big disadvantages. Uh, we are the first one to do, you know. Uh, racing simulator in, into the Unreal Graphic Engine and you saw that some things are extremely good and but there are also some disadvantages pretty much as everything you know so uh, there is still you know we're, we're still thinking about it and until now I mean on the PC we got some great great results we are struggling a little bit on, on the uh, on the consoles but again it was easy, it was easier to port it so, but again, I'm, I'm not the best person to talk about that. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, the most knowledgeable person to talk about uh, the, the graphic engine. Um, uh, in the engine, so Danny Roy says, driving close behind another car in a very long time will cause temp changes in brakes or engine. In engine, not really, not that much. Brakes a little bit more, maybe uh, you need some clean air uh, because driving behind another car, uh, the air is less dense. So, being less dense, uh, the brakes are getting they have less cooling. Uh, so, that kind of might be a problem. But usually, those cars don't have a big problem. GT4 cars are it's a little bit trickier because they are heavier 
and have less downforce and the braking distances are longer so some of those guys have you know brake fade so watch out uh no there's no gt86 gt4 when it's too much speed uh, when it strokes it out i didn't understood that sorry my logo on the page ah right <laughs> uh any where did you see no idea Well, yes, bump stops are very sensitive, so you have to be careful what you're doing with bump stops. Uh, Martin Breuker asks, um, how I create more turn-in by changing the arrow? Uh, how do I decide if I do it by lowering the rear wing or increasing the right height? Because both will decrease rear downforce. Yeah, well, lowering the rear uh, wing uh, will decrease the downforce more, but more importantly, will make the car more pitch sensitive. And if you go and watch my previous video, you will understand that those cars are extremely pitch sensitive. And this is something to be very careful about it. So if you don't want more pitch sensitiveness, don't lower the rear wing, but raise the rear right height. If you can deal with, uh, you know, less pitch sensitiveness, then um, lower the, the, the rear wing. Raising the rear right height, it doesn't generate less downforce. Be careful. It might even generate more downforce. But it moves the downforce forward. It moves the, the balance of the, down, of the downforce forward, so it makes the car... Uh, less under steering or uh, you know more over steering depending on what you want uh, so raising the rear right height doesn't necessarily uh, generates less downforce actually usually generates more downforce because the rear diffuser wants more pits to generate more downforce but the balance the aero balance move it moves forward so keep an eye on that i don't know about the competition servers that's tough for kevin uh, do I often drive linear cars on trucks when there's not a pandemic? Yes. Um, yep, yep. Now, well, uh, what I'm doing on physics, uh, Stefano Casillo creates the physics engine. Stefano Casillo is no more, but we have now Fernando Barbarossa, which took, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the place of, of Stefano Casillo in terms of physics as he is doing an incredible uh, job. Uh, many of the new things that we have now with the Sotokoso Commission is also part of his uh, work. He's really a talented guy, uh, a very nice going guy also. Uh, big prop, uh, prop to that. Obviously worked very closely with Stefano uh, to understand everything. And he's doing the physics now. He's doing the physics engine. And he's taking care of... Um, of uh, the physics engine uh, in terms of um, how to say uh, the basic stuff you know rigid body simulation water simulation all that stuff uh, and then he makes me happy because my job is to go and analyze what real cars do uh, if they have new futures how they do them uh, find out if we're doing something wrong or if we're doing something that needs to be you know uh, made differently and then I'm going with feedback to, to him with documents, with papers, whatever uh, and I have to showcase uh, to him what we should do and then he programs it. Once he have it programmed then it's my job to put inside all the uh, data I get from the manufacturers, from my experience, from telemetries, from reverse engineering, from whatever uh, and make the cars handle properly validate them which means compare them with the actual uh, real telemetry lab times all the stuff create setups uh find bugs all the stuff this, this is my job uh so it's always a two guys uh, job 
uh, Gregors again how to overdrive the car what's the last video we we put out uh, I, I put uh, today um, no no changes in Zandvoort we're doing just the 2019 Zandvoort um, okay okay let, let, let's try to do uh, weight shift uh, weight transfer and uh, lot of well, first of all do you guys want to do that do you feel fresh enough it's it's gonna be a little bit hard so hello Matthew Leclerc welcome and Marcus Falcon welcome and Daniel O'Brien and M Tybee welcome to the channel so let me know in the chat if you guys are willing to stay with me for another half an hour or maybe you know one hour and explain some um, some theory stuff okay uh, some vehicle uh, handling and physics stuff so if you want I will do it we'll try at least we give it a go uh, and uh, if you don't want we can do it you know next time no big deal thank you so much <laughs> all right so okay so i see from the chat that you guys uh are willing to to do hard stuff so let's try it let's try it okay All right, so let me take care of everything here. Okay. So what we're gonna do? Well, first thing, let me uh, switch here. Get out from this. <laughs> the question is, are you awake enough to do it? I doubt it, but <laughs> we can try. Um, all right, so let me see here. We have this, so we can go over here and see whatever I have prepared for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so no, no, it's not hammer time. This is uh, this is more, more, more serious stuff. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, let's go back. Oops. Come on. Let's go here and uh, move over here. Okay. All right. So, ciao, Zan. Grazie. All right. So let me, let's move here. Okay. So I have prepared these little uh, things for for you guys. Now it's very important to use and often we do not use it i'm guilty I'm guilty myself all right to use the correct terms because we have load transfer and then we have weight transfer okay so today we're gonna find out the differences between load transfer and weight transfer and find out what it means first of all and what also what also is the difference uh, between you know in terms of okay how much uh, is the weight transfer and how much is the load transfer okay so let's try uh, with uh, let, let's start this this part uh, all of that because we want to understand what is happening um, if we have a narrow track or a wider track or you know if we have a shorter wheelbase or a longer wheelbase okay how the load transfer makes things differently okay all right so 
we start first of all with load transfer. Load transfer is what mainly happens on the car. So what is load transfer? Now, first of all, we have the center of gravity of the car. For those cars, it is more or less uh, around uh, 400 millimeters, 40 centimeters from the ground. Okay, so uh, the uh, center of gravity is somewhere around 400 millimeters. Some cars stay at you know 380. Some cars are 410. We will take the 400, which is you know uh, a good a good um, rounded number, and that's it. Now, when the car is stationary and nothing happens, okay. Uh, obviously, the weight of the car goes to load the tires. Okay, and those cars usually are around uh, 1,400 kilos. Okay, uh, without fuel. Uh, often without the driver, so we are going at, at about 1,500 kilos with some fuel and the driver. So it's 1,500 kilos, okay, 1,500 kilos, 1,500 kilos. So what happens when the car goes into a turn, okay? Now, the, later, the, the, turn, the, the car accelerates because it, ro it rotates and you know, makes a different line to turn around. So it has a lateral force. It gets something like this, you know, by going into a turn. Uh, that force is acting on the center of gravity. Now, obviously, acting that force on the center of gravity, it means that the car is going to load the outside uh, tires much more. Okay? So... Let's see if this is the correct. No, that's the other one. So it's going to load the outside tires right here, which means that this one is going to get more load, while this one is going to get less load. Okay, now, why is that and by how much? Right, so let's get one of the Bibles of uh, uh, car engineering, handling, and so on, which... Is one of the, of the biggest and most important books. It's Race Car Engineering by um, Mitchell, uh, which is also the creator of the WinZeo uh, software, one of the most famous softwares for car handling. Uh, also, um, other stuff by Salinas, uh, mathematical modeling, etc., etc. Anyway, this is one of the biggest and most important you know books you can get. Uh, it has tons and tons of information. Um, so, into this page, we have the formula for the load transfer, right? Which is right here, and I will write it down for you so that you can uh, have a go. So, uh, what what is the formula for the load transfer? Uh, where is the text here and here? Okay, so we have. Uh, Lateral load transfer. Now that is equal to. Um, so what is it? So weight, total weight, multiplied by the lateral forces, lat G, multiplied by uh, the center of gravity, the height of the center of gravity. Okay, and all of that is divided by the track. Aha! So, here it is, actually. Okay, and uh, let me put that into a decent color of this stupid little program, but it helps what we want to do. Okay, and put it bold like this. So, that is the equation to understand how much load transfer we get. Okay? All right. Okay, so since we have this equation, let's start to. Um, as you can see, it's it's pretty simple, right? It's pretty simple. So the first thing that we want to to do is start, you know, um, taking our variables and putting proper numbers into that. 
So let me double this, all right? And wait, we said we are at around uh, 1,500 kilos, okay? Good. And lateral Z, now those cars laterally, they arrive at around, depending, let's say sustained lateral Z, 1.4, 1.5, let's say 1.4, okay? Let's say 1.5, 1.5, okay, 1.5 Z. Center of gravity, we said it is around 400 millimeters. And the track is the distance, of course, from the center of one um, tire to, to the center of the other tire, which is uh, usually at uh, 1,600 millimeters, right? So this is it. So this is our situation. Now, if you put that into a calculator and you go like 105, multiplied by 1.5, multiplied by 400, okay, divided by 160, you get 562, and those are kilograms. 562 kilos are moved to the outside, so from, from the center, so you have like those 150 kilos, okay, so half of them will go on the one side of the car and the other half will go on the other side. Instead, you get like, here you get 750, to let you understand what is going on. Normally, here, you're gonna have, come on, come on, little program, you can do it. Maybe not, come on, program. Uh, no, the program doesn't want to do it. Uh, let's try it again. So, text uh, here. Okay, so, normally you have here 750 kilos. Okay? Like this. And, uh, and then you have another 750 kilos on the other side. Okay? That is the car stationary. Now, when the car starts to turn on 1.5G, what you get is you get 750 kilos plus 562. All right? So you get something like this 750 plus 562. You get 1,300 kilos on one side. So this becomes 1,300 uh, something. What was it? 1,312 kilos. 12 kilos on one side, okay? And on the other side, of course, you get 750 minus 562 uh, was something like this, 182 kilos. So this is an incredible amount of load transfer, all right? So this is what happens in your car when you are, you know, at the limit of the grip. When you are turning at the limit of the grip, the outside uh, tires get a load of 130, uh, 130 uh, 1,300 kilos, and the load on the inside tires is 188 kilos. Now, on top of that, you get the downforce. The downforce gets, you know, divided equally both left and right, more or less. Um, so um, you you get an uh, incredible amount of, uh, uh, of of weight transfer, right? Um, so this is why even when you have small amounts of difference of weight at the front or at the rear, you get the car to move around in understeer or in oversteer. Because uh, even small differences front and rear changes the whole equilibrium of the car. All right. So, as you saw, this is the load transfer, and it is a very, very big amount of transfer on the load of the tires. Okay. Now, this happens 
this happens, either you have suspension or not. In the go-karts, you don't have suspension. Even if you had wooden tires, that would happen anyway, because it depends on the lateral g-force or longitudinal. It's the same, OK? Obviously, the load will change front or backwards. So either it is lateral or longitudinal. So it depends on the acceleration that you have, lateral or longitudinal. It depends on the center of gravity height. So that is why the single seaters can you know, accelerate much faster, because their center of gravity is lower. Okay? And lower center of gravity means that you have less weight transfer, and the less weight, uh, sorry, you have less load transfer. And the less load transfer you have, the, bet, the more grip you can, you can create. Okay? And I will explain you why in a minute. Uh, and uh, also it depends on how long, uh, how big is the track width. The longer the track width, again, the less, because as you see, it divides everything. Longer track, track width or wheelbase, if we're talking longitudinally, less load transfer, less load transfer. Now, why we want to have less load transfer? Now, um, here's the situation. Let me do a new page. Now, the tires generate grip in a particular way. So let's say that, sorry, I haven't uh, made that before. So this is practically a graph we're trying to do, OK? So in this graph, oops, wrong uh, tab, sorry about that. We are in here, hopefully. It maintain, yeah, okay. So, so here how the tires generate grab, uh, grip. Now, this is the grip. So let me put here grip. Grip of the tires, okay. Or actually, no, let me put this load. Sorry, that's easier to understand. Load, okay. And uh, here we have. Now, actually, it's the other way around. Sorry about that. It starts to become late. So, uh, grip again here and uh, load here. Okay? Nice. Okay. So, this is what happens. Now, as the load raises from zero, the tires generate grip. One to one. One one and so on now the problem is and here's the big problem with the tires and that is why we're trying to minimize the load transfer have less weight on the car all that stuff okay now um, the more the load goes up the more grip you have but it doesn't stays linear by adding more and more load on the tires, okay, the tires start to generate less and less grip. Okay, so this is the situation. This is what, what the tires do. Okay, so at some point, the tires don't even generate any more grip. You want to have a very simple uh, example of that. Okay, this is, this is pretty, pretty uh, um, impressive if, if you can do it. So um, take, take your finger, right, and just slide it into any surface, OK? Now, obviously, you can feel some grip, OK? So you slide your finger into a surface, and you feel some small resistance. Now, when you're pushing your, your, your finger down the surface, you feel more resistance. This is grip. You generate more grip because you're pushing more. Now, if you keep pushing as hard as you can, as hard as you can, uh, impossible, obviously, don't break your finger, but push your, your finger into the surface as hard as you can, okay, and you will notice that you can still slide your finger around. There is no way that you can push 
hard enough to not be able to slide your finger around. You can push as hard. You will feel, you know, heat, lots of heat, because that is what's happening when you are, you know, sliding around and also to your tires. But you cannot stop your tire, for your, your, your finger from sliding. This is because all the rubbery things, you know, the, the leather is a rubbery thing in the end. They generate grip in the same kind of way. Uh, you keep adding load and you get more grip, more grip, more grip. And then at some point, the load, the, the grip starts to generate less than the amount of load that you are adding. So you add more load, but the grip is less. Okay. You're not, it's not, it doesn't continue linearly. Uh, so you give like, one load, just a number, one, let's say, 10 kilos, okay? And you get one grip. You give two load, and you get 1.8 grip. You give three load, and you get 2.5 grip. You give four load, and you get two grip. So, you see, they don't go up at the same time. So, um, <laughs> so John Smith now has graining on his fingertip. Um, keep the, the temperature correct and do smoother, you know, uh, slides around and you see that the grainy will go away. Don't keep doing it because you're going to get blistering and that's pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so if uh, CC driver says, what should my wife think? If your wife, you know, goes, gets inside to your room and sees you doing that, just tell her that you are, you know, watching some porn or stuff. It's safer than... Uh, telling here that some Greek guy told you to do this with your fingers. So <laughs> it's much better, trust me. <laughs> okay. So um, so this is why we are trying to limit, you know, the load transfer because the load transfer is a lot, is a lot. And the less it is, the more we can deal with the grip generating by the tires. Okay. So as we said, one of the most important things is the track width. You see, the, everything you do here, you divide it by the track width. So if the track width is wider, then the load transfer is less. And so you have a better uh, situation of, of uh, grip from all the four tires. Okay? Um, so uh, and that also happens in the same exact way with the wheelbase. With the wheelbase, you have load transfer to the front when you are braking and to the rear under acceleration okay now the shorter the wheelbase as we said the porsche has a very short wheelbase the shorter of all of the cars okay the shorter the wheelbase the higher the load transfer will be we explained that why here because here you won't have the the track with but you're going to have, because it's going to be longitudinal, you're going to have the wheelbase. Okay, so instead of track here, let's get those things. Whoops, sorry. Let's get copy and copy past them here. And this becomes wheelbase. Right, so this becomes wheelbase. And that obviously goes to something like, uh, I don't remember, for the Porsche, something like 245, something like that. Okay. Um, so this is it again, uh, and you can understand the load transfer. Now, if instead of 2,450 millimeters, we have something like 300 millimeters, which is the wheelbase of the Bentley or the BMW, it's almost three meters long. Okay. You can understand that the load transfer between back and forth is much less. And so the car is more stable when you are braking, when you're going over the curbs, like while accelerating or braking and so on. While the load transfer on uh, the uh, on the Porsche, which has, has much uh, shorter wheelbase, is much higher and faster. Okay, And because of that, the car is more reactive uh, and more nervous. It's good because it's agile, but it's also more nervous. So... This is what it happens with load transfer. Everything clear up to here? Right, so 
How is the load influenced by the stiffness of the springs? Ask Poasma Uia. Uh, well, it doesn't really influence the the uh, the load, the amount of load. Okay, the, the the stiffness of the springs or or the arms doesn't really influence the amount of well the arms not exactly. Sorry about that. The stiffness of the spring doesn't really influence the amount of load transfers, but it does influence the speed of the load transfer. Because obviously, if you have a car that has no suspension, the load transfer will happen instantly. You, stir, you, you turn the wheel and boom, all the load transfer goes into the outside uh, tires instantly as you move your steering wheel, right? Now, when you have springs, when you have suspension, you move the steering wheel and obviously you get some load transfer, but at the same time, the whole body of the car starts to roll, okay, or starts to pitch, okay, depending if you are longitudinally or laterally. So laterally, it starts to roll. While it is rolling, it absorbs some of the load, which means that at some point it will end the roll and all the load will go and move at the outside wheels. But in the meantime, the load happens a little bit slower. So that difference in speed of the load happening uh, helps you maintain a different, a different control on the grip of the two axes. Okay? So for example, you put stiffer springs at the front, and so the load at the front will happen before the rear. Okay? That will make the front end more precise and fast because the load will happen, uh, the load transfer will happen faster, but when you will, you know, reach the peak, then you will also go over the peak and you will go into have, you know, understeer, right, because you are uh, arriving at the peak sooner and you obviously uh, going over the limit sooner if you have a stiffer front end. Likewise, and vice versa, if you have a stiffer rear end and so on. Um, okay, so this is the load, okay? This is the load. Now, um, how about the weight transfer? Now, that's interesting. The weight transfer is different than the load transfer. We always say about weight transfer, about weight transfer, but what we really mean is the load transfer, because as you saw, the load transfer is much, much, it's, it's really big in, in terms of numbers. The load transfer is really, really big in terms of numbers. How big is the weight transfer? And most importantly, what is the weight transfer? So, let's go here. Weight transfer. Okay, weight transfer. We have the same exact situation as before. It's a car, center of gravity, load equally divided, okay, um, in, in your four wheels. We just look at two of them, but just imagine that there are another two of them behind. Now, you start, you know, turning, and when you turn and you have a suspension, what happens? The body of the car rolls, okay? So the body of the car rolls. Also, the tires are compressed differently, and the tires also help adding to the roll amount of the car. But let's not go into this. Let's imagine that the tires are completely stiff, wooden tires, and we have the body of the car rolling. So what is going to happen? Well, here's what is going to happen. We're going to have a car rolling. It's exaggerated, of course, in the graph so that you can understand. Okay. And by rolling like this, the center of gravity will move outside. This is the new center of gravity. Perfect. Clear, right? It's obvious now. The car rolls. Because the body of the car rolls, the whole center of gravity moves towards the outside. Okay? Cool. Um, right. So, um, so what happens next? Sorry about that. I was watching at the, at the chat. Okay. So, um, what happens here? Well, because obviously the center of gravity moves towards the outside, it means that we don't have the weight of the uh, of, of the body 
of the car, which is the bigger one, right? We don't have that weight of the body equally distributed left and right. It's not equally distributed anymore, because in uh, in in this condition, as we were before, okay, the center of gravity is exactly at the middle, so you have half of the weight at the left tires and half of the weight at the right tires. Now, in this new situation, okay, the center of, of gravity is not in the center uh, of the track width anymore, which means that uh, the one side of, of the tires will get more weight than the other side. Now, for the sake of simplicity, we will not calculate the load transfer. As you know, the load transfer is a lot when we turn, but for the sake of the simplicity, let's say that we weight load transfer doesn't happen for whatever reason, magic, <laughs> magic, okay? So we don't have load transfer here, okay? But we do have this center of gravity movement uh, on one side. Now, by how, how much, okay, by how much? Now, here's what's, what's happened. It's, it's, uh, we, we can calculate how much the center of gravity moved to the one side. So let's first put a vertical line here. Okay, so this is the vertical line in exactly the middle of the balance situation. Okay, and now we are moving the car in roll. So this vertical line obviously rolls, okay, Let's move a circle here to point our rotation. So from there, we have a rotation. Now, what that means? means that practically we have a triangle, okay? This is our triangle here. Uh, let me see where I have it. Here it is. We have a triangle. This is the place, okay? This is the line, the vertical line that goes to the old center of gravity. This is the parallel line that goes to the new uh, placement of the center of gravity. And here we have an angle uh, of, of the triangle. Okay. Now, um, with uh, so wh what can we do? We want to find out how much the center of gravity has been moved to the one side. Okay, so we want to find out this part here okay this part here let's make it uh green like this so that we can have a look oops sorry okay so we want to know exactly how big is the movement now because we have a normal triangle with a little bit of trigonometry <laughs> uh, we can we can we can find out okay so what we need to do um, we need we need to get the tan the tan the tan of this angle and uh, multiply it i think by uh, the um, adjacent here this part of the triangle um and and that will give us and that will give us the length of the opposite so we need to know the amount of roll usually on those cars you are at two from two to three degrees something like that no, not much more so let's let's take two degrees okay so let's take two degrees and find out um the tan should be here. I think this is it. So it's that strange number, and multiply it by that side. That side is the height of the center of gravity. So it's 400. Boom, 13.9. So let's say 14 millimeters. The center of gravity has moved 14 millimeters to one side. Okay. So if we know that. Then we can do again. We have everything here on the book. I think it's here. Uh, oh, I've lost the page. But anyway, I think I, I can I can find out that by myself. So the weight 
so let's find this out maybe i have it somewhere here saved it ah, i think i found it okay so we don't do any error so the weight uh, on one side let's say yeah this side so what's gonna be that so it's the weight of the vehicle okay multiplied by uh the center of gravity uh sorry the center of gravity distance from from the wheels okay uh, lateral distance from the wheels uh divided again by okay so let's do this center of gravity uh from wheels lateral i don't know if you can understand that and again divided by the track width of the car okay so oh my god it's it's green dear god green okay so bold something like that i hope i've written this correctly now that becomes something like this so we have the weight that it is five 100 500 okay now this is normally because the track is you know uh 1600 millimeters oops like that this will be 800 800 okay this is normally when the center of gravity is in the middle but we said that this is no no longer the case okay this is no longer the case because we have this one that is 800 plus uh, what did we had here? 14 millimeters extra. 14 millimeters. All right? So this is going to be our weight on one side rolling. Okay? So let's see what we got here. If we did everything correctly, forgive me if I made any, any error. So 100, whoops. Actually, let's do... Um, uh, one uh, multiplied by 814 okay divided by 1600 763 763 so we have 763 kilos here instead of the 750 kilos okay because normally what do we have here we we had I hope you you remind uh, you we have 70, 750 kilos from each side, which brings us to 150 uh, kilos total, all right? So we have something like this, and now we have 763. Uh, and obviously, on the other side, we're gonna have, um, where, where is my calculator? We're gonna have 150 minus 763, 737. Okay, so at this point here, we're going to have 737. Right, so this is the end result. So as you can see, okay, as you can see, um, the difference is 13 kilos. This is the weight transfer. Actually, it's even less because you know what? We did something we shouldn't have done. Now, here we, we said that the whole weight of the car is 1,000. Uh, 1,500 kilos, but in reality, the center of gravity moves just for the body. The wheels, which are, are about 100 kilos all around, okay, uh, they are not part of, of this body movement. So this should have been 1,400 kilos. So the end result would be even less than 13 kilos. Just 30 kilos of weight transfer. It's still important. It's still important, and you can still change it by having different roll bars, um, dampers, um, springs, and so on. Uh, but it's still very low, and in comparison to the load transfer, is practically nothing. So the most important thing is the load transfer, and then another important thing is the weight transfer. But again, that's why aerodynamics are so important, and the difference in speed of the load transfer and the difference in load transfer between front and rear axis is what matters. 
with ma what matters. Um, obviously, if you have something much wider in roll, so let's say that you have a street car that has 10 degrees of roll, then you know things start to become uh, uh, much more important. So, for example, if you have 1,500 kilos of streetcar, and usually, you know, all streetcars are, are even more. So let's say 100, 600, 1,600 kilos, all right? And you have shorter wheelbase. So you have something like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 1,500 uh, uh, millimeters. And you have 10 degrees. So 10 degrees uh, of roll, let's go get the... Um, the ton is this one multiplied by half a meter of center of gravity because usually street cars are around half a meter, so multiplied by 500. Already, this, this thing becomes 88 millimeters. We had 16, 14, 14 millimeters before, and now this one on a street car, you know, it becomes 18. 88, sorry, 88. Massive difference. So if you do all the calculations, you see that you have, you know, one person moving around when you are, you know, turning around into a street car. But let's not go into that. So, <clears throat> so here's the difference. Here's the situation, and here's the difference between load transfer, weight transfer. Again, I'm oversimplifying whatever, wherever I can because, as you can see, there's lots of you know, uh, things uh, in here, maths, stuff, things are more important. But uh, the fact of uh, the, the speed of the load transfer, uh, again, it's not correct. We talk about the speed of the load transfer, right? It's not correct. It's not correct. But it is a simple way to understand what's happening. It really helps our athletes. It really helps me to understand what I'm doing when I'm making one axis uh, stiffer than the other one and that is also with dampers springs uh, all of that stuff that you know limit the body movement when you limit the body movement the load transfer in my mind becomes faster and that means more precision but also going over the limit sooner okay uh, while when you have everything softer it means less precision because you have to do something and wait for the car you know, to take set, to make the load transfer, but also because everything happens slower, it gives you more time to react and not go over the limit. So we're still talking about less of a tenth of a second stuff, but every little thing helps you because, as we said, uh, we humans are slower than reality. You know, <laughs> reality happens in tenths of a second. We need at least two tenths of a second of reaction time of reflexes. So every time you can gain a little bit, um, for example, uh, the very fast swim racers, aliens, probably have reflection times that are close to uh, 150 tenths of a, of a second. Okay, normal guys are around 200 to uh, 250 uh, tenths of a second. Very slow guys, unfortunately, there are also guys like that. They are like 300. So those guys need a slower car with a slower load transfer. Okay, so um, blah, 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 blah. I hope it was clear enough. I know it's difficult. Probably you wanna you know watch it again and again and again. Uh, but I think the explanation was. Pretty good, decent, as we say. Uh, it was pretty good, and obviously I will cut it and make it a separate uh, short video uh, so that you guys can watch it uh, easier and understand easier what is uh, what is going on. Um, so here it is. Let me know on the chat. Let me know if you have things that you would like to to ask or or to see or stuff, something like that. Um, but I think that that's all for tonight, except except if you guys have questions and answers. And, um, and in the meantime, what I want to do on the next uh, days. Friday, it's going to be 
BMW M6 uh, practice at Spa for race setup. Uh, it's going to be mainly in Italian. I will try to reply in questions in English if possible, mainly in Italian. Uh, somewhere around uh, midweek again next week. So, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, like this next week. We're going to do uh, an extra live stream in English. Uh, I will either go into a server of a great friend and driver of the ring taxi uh, one of the ring taxis at the Nürburgring and talk with him also and maybe do a little interview with him and also I would like to show you how to set up your car for a race and how uh, the Porsche is uh, a car that you have to be uh, even more uh, careful to set up for, for race uh, and how uh, the weight distribution changes during a race on the Porsche. Uh, and then next Friday will be again practice M6 at Spa again in Italian. And uh, next uh, Saturday, you're going to have the eight hours endurance race. Again, Italian, some parts in English, but mainly Italian uh, for our Italian friends that they have been a lot of time without a uh, dedicated uh, uh, live stream for, for them. Uh, but again, you know, uh, I'm going to also reply in English uh, as, as much as, as possible, you know, in limits. Uh, the book in my description. Yeah, sure, sure thing. Uh, yes, Jorge, Jorge, Jose. Uh, the SIM channel is in the rig again after almost a year. Great to hear about that. Well done. Uh, he asks if I can share my DD1 settings. Actually, I have DD2, but I have made a video about that, specific video. So let me see if I can find uh, the, uh, the link. And uh, you can go there and uh, have all the settings that you need, mate. Um, so let's see if I can find it. Uh, I don't remember is if it's in the uh, did you know let's see if it's there uh, po -po 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 -po. I'm searching uh, give me just a little bit of uh, time no it's not here so it must have been in uh, too long didn't watch probably um, Where is it? Where is it? I cannot find it. Oh, come on. Ah, here it is. I found it. I just got the correct thing for you. So, um, where are you guys? Squeeze uh, Arrivo. Uh, so, uh, quick uh, and... Uh, uh, quick and dirty FFB settings uh, for pretty much for steering wheels, wheels here, and here you are. Okay. Uh, uh, excited for GT4. I will. I will. Um, Okay, let, let's uh, reply. Squizzo says, uh, domanda veloce, qual è la pressione ottimale per le gomme da bagnato? Mm, attorno ai 30 PSI. 30, ok? 29,5, 35, lì, 30.5. Uh, so what is the correct uh, pressure for uh, wet tires? It's uh, around 30 PSI. So 29.5, 30.5, somewhere around uh, 30. Uh, do any of my previous videos explain impact of brake balance on a car with ABS? Uh, yes, I think mm, plenty of videos like that. And also the last video will also show you some stuff about this. Hello. Kalunga JPEG says, hello, Aris, any suggestions to set up the Porsche GT3 cap, the cap for my race in Zandvoort next Monday? 
Well, the cap is even more difficult because, of course, it doesn't have uh, downforce and it's uh, a little bit more. It doesn't have traction control. But I believe if you have a watch uh, at the video, at the last video we did, uh, and I have uh, you know uh, posted um, this morning, and I will give you the link here. Uh, I think uh, y y you're gonna find uh, good. Um, Good things to to you know to to implement to to your setup. So uh, I would advise that you go here. Uh, let me give you the link and do pretty much everything we discuss into into this video. Um, uh, Bruno Tex, we have a specific video for the bump stop. Uh, go and find the playlist which explains how to set up your car. There's step one, step two, step three. Each step is a video. And on those steps, you also have an explanation of what uh, the bump stops do, how they affect the car handling and aerodynamics. They are there to affect the aerodynamics, uh, the aerodynamic platform, and how to set them up to, to make the car uh, behave as you want. Um... What else uh, we have here? Other questions? Uh, <laughs> uh, the flags around the circuit, they are not an indicator of direction and speed uh, of the wind, unfortunately. No, Matteo, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's not like that. But fortunately, um, if, you, if you go to the multifunctional display, okay? And I will show you right away what it means. And I also have a video explaining how to assign keys for the multifunctional display and how to operate it. So if you change the multifunctional display, which is here, all that pages, you see it, you have different pages. So when you arrive at the page of the pit stop, you also get information for the, me for, for, for the weather, meteo. So the next 10 minutes and the next 30 minutes, if the time is accelerated, it's going to say, you know, different minutes or one minute or five minutes or stuff like that. Uh, you get information about the track rubber, uh, uh, fast, green or optimum, uh, the temperature of the ambient and the track temperature, and most importantly, the wind. So as you ask, the wind here, uh, this is the icon. The icon here is the car from above. Uh, the arrow is the direction of the wind uh, that updates in real time as you are driving around. So, for example, right now the wind is directly from the side. And you can see that as I'm turning, you will see that it will probably change. If it doesn't change, this is because we have no wind at all. So, yeah, that's the problem right now. We don't have any wind, so let's go back to the weather and show you what happens when we have some wind. Uh, so usually to have wind, uh, you need um, rain, heavy rain, variability, something like that. Lots of variability. Let's put it like this. Yeah, something like this. Uh, and uh, let's go in and hopefully we will have some some wind here and show you again uh, here we have 60 kilometers of wind very good so let's okay so as you will see here okay watch my mouse the small arrow turns around as I'm moving around the circuit and obviously, the, the, the arrow shows where the wind is arriving from your car, as you can see the car on top here. So, right now the wing is from my left side, okay? And a little bit from behind, now I'm turning here, okay? And it will update, and now the wing is from the front of my car, and a little bit to, uh, it's arriving from a little bit to the right, okay? And now it's directly ahead of me, and so on, and so on. So this is how you can check uh, where is the wind coming from, 
uh, while we, you are you are driving in a race with a dynamic weather. All right. Okay. Um, Levy six eight fifty nine new to driving GT three cars. Welcome aboard. And do I have any videos on driving techniques? I have all the videos that you want on how to drive the GT three car. So start from the first video: how to understand your car, what the uh, how how to drive them, uh, what you need. I mean, start from the first video and move ahead. You're gonna find everything, I believe. Um, uh, how has been my impression of the console version reception so far? It's mixed, obviously, uh, because because we have plenty of people that they are extremely satisfied, and plenty of people that, as usual, don't have even you know mid measure. Some some people are polite and you know have some problems. I understand, and we're trying to help them. Uh, some people are just out of their minds. One of the things that really bites me also on various uh, YouTube videos, although I was very, very glad to see the big YouTubers all, you know, trying the game and being extremely impressed by the fact that we have the same physics, okay, and the same sounds and the same uh, uh, dynamic meteor weather and uh, 24 hours. And every, I mean, it's the same game, okay? Even the setups are the same. Um, but there is one thing I have to say about it. Um, everybody is comparing the game to the PC version. Now, obviously, you're going to say, well, of course. They were. But it's not exactly the point here, because the console version is not for the people that they have the game into the PC version. It's for the people that they have only the console version, for whatever reason. Okay, And... The people with the console version, they're going to play against other people with the same situation. So, yes, of course, 30 frames per second is much lower than whatever PC version you have that has higher graphics. And, you know, you get to do 60, 90, 100, 200 frames per second if you have, I don't know, a, a Cray computer or whatever. Um, of course, it's going to be lower frame rate, obviously. So what? It's not a comparison. We are talking modern PCs with consoles that, you know, they are, I don't know, five, seven years uh, old hardware. So obviously the frame rate is different. Uh, I believe that it's not a comparison that you can really make for a long time. I mean, yes, okay, you can say, okay, this is 30 frame, the other, you know, on the PC, the graphics are better and the frame rate is much higher and so on. And of discussion that's it but to compare the two of them and say but yeah the, the the lower frame in the consoles everybody would be on a level field even more leveled than the pc version because in the pc version you have people that you know gonna play on 60 frames and people gonna play on 200 frames per second in the console everybody will be at 30 frames per second you can see the videos that when you're driving you're driving and you uh, actually you know get the same great experience uh, of, of driving simulation. So obviously the frame rate is a bit low, but it is a good experience. So it doesn't really make much sense to keep on going with the comparison, doesn't it? I mean, okay, but that's it. Uh, correcting the Thrustmaster FFB. As I said, if you look at the videos of famous people, they have played it even with Thrustmaster. I mean, even David Perel played it, and they had no issues at all. So, undeniably, some people are having issues. Some people, the first feedback doesn't work, or some people, the pedals doesn't work. We are looking into it. We have made a specific page so that you can go and leave uh, bugs and report. And the guys responsible of D3T, the agency that did the conversion, we are looking into it and trying to find out. That's unfortunate because, you know, normally on the console you expect that everything is plug and play. But on some configurations, for whatever reason, it doesn't work like that. But it seems that it's a combination of some strange configurations and something in the software that doesn't, you know, works. But normally it works because you can see the YouTubers, you know, showcasing the game with the same exact force feedback as the PC. Uh, and Thrustmaster wheels or Logitech wheels. From my side, 
Again, I cannot give support because I don't know what to tell you about it. Uh, I don't have a console. But what I can say is um, make sure the rotation limits of your wheel are correct. Assetto Corsa Competizione asks for 900 degrees. Some people are having some success with 540, but it asks for 900 degrees. And you still have also in the options 900 degrees. And uh, uh, this is what you need. Uh, I understand that some of you guys are having, you know, 180 degrees because you are used to, you know, use the steering wheels like that. It doesn't work. The best indication is that when you're driving, you want your real steering wheel and the steering wheel on the uh, on the virtual uh, cockpit. You want it. You, you put it at 90 degrees, and you want to have one one uh, same exact angle. If the virtual steering wheel is way ahead or way behind, something is wrong with the steering wheel rotation, make it, uh, find out the way. For example, in the Thrustmaster page, there is a combination with uh, option key and some arrow keys that you can press, and the LEDs are flashing, and that indicates you if you have 90 degrees steering wheel, 180 degrees, 270, 540, 900 degrees. Put it at 900, all right? Um, guy saying Forza 7 has the best physics ever. Come on, guys. I mean, yeah, maximum respect for the game, whatever you want, but I mean, not even a comparison here. Um, uh, Again, Goru, that's a lot of people complaining. That's a lot of people that you look that they are complaining and making noise. At the same time, I can tell you, okay, that yesterday we had more people playing on console version on the lobbies than people playing on the PC lobbies. So we're talking north of 3,000 people all at the same time on the servers, which means that for them, you know, they're not 100 people anymore or 200 people or 500 people. There are thousands of people playing online and probably the same amount playing offline. Uh, and it works for them. So you always have to, I mean, I understand if you have a problem, obviously you're going to say, oh, it doesn't work for me. And I found another 20 people on the forms that doesn't work for them or 100 people the forms that doesn't work for them. So certainly there is a big bug and you have to fix it. Absolutely, something is wrong because it should work for you too. But it's not, you know, you have to take things into perspective. Probably it's not so many people as you think they are. Because obviously the guys that they are enjoying it, they are not going around the forums complaining. They are just enjoying it and that's it. Uh, this has always been the case also in the PC. Eh? It's not just a console thing. Uh, Alexander, you have to make sure that you have 900 on the steering wheel and also in the control options, 900 or, you know, like, like this here. It should be the same. If, if there is an error in that, then maybe we have a bug and we will investigate it. So again, I advise you, if, if you have the same things and it doesn't work one-to-one, -one, write on, on that page uh, and explain the, the situation. Uh, make sure that you know you are correct, and the guys will certainly look at it and uh, try to find the solution as soon as possible. Um... Yeah, a lot, a lot of people have consoles. A lot of people have consoles, so. Yes, yes, uh, Goku, uh, uh, sorry, Goruk, Goruk. Man, I, I totally understand your frustration. I can't even tell you how sad I am that you cannot enjoy the game. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry about it. Uh, it's, it's also mind-blowing to, to us too, because, you know, console, it's plug and play. Stick, you know, the steering wheel inside the console, switch on the console, load the game, Go play. That's it, right? And yet, I mean, we even uh, saw people yesterday that they managed somehow. I'm not. I'm not saying 
it's their wrong or it's your wrong. Not at all. I'm not putting the blame on you guys. Absolutely not. I'm just, you know, showing what's the problem. We saw people that they managed ha somehow to make the, the game play in some strange resolution and the game was going outside the bounds of, of the monitor or the TV, the t TV set that they had, and wrong resolutions, which means extremely pixelated graphics and also low, even lower frame rate. And we were like, how is that possible? How is that even possible? How you can, you know, uh, mess up with the configuration with the console, which is, you know, switch it on, boom, runs. And yet, it happens. And uh, I don't know. Honestly, I don't have a console, so I don't understand. I'm pretty sure the guys that they are responsible for the support for the consoles are having all, all the answers and they will start, you know, helping people. Or if there is a bug, they will find out and tweak it and, and uh, release some, some parts. As usual, I will ask for all your patience because uh, releasing patches on the console is not as easy as on the PC where if we find something in 10 minutes, if we, if we manage to fix it, in 10 minutes it's already out on Steam. On the console, you need, again, to do a submission. Uh, you need some times and you get out. It is what it is. We are a small fee, so we go through the whole procedure. Uh, so thank you already for your, for your patience. Um, well, the, the break gamma is simply, I mean, if the break gamma is 1, then it's linear. So it means uh, 10 millimeters uh, pressure, I mean, range uh, travel on the break, it gives you 10 force uh, of breaking force. 20, 20, 30, 30, and so on, okay? Or break force if you have a large cell, it's the same. Uh, if you raise the break gamma, then this linear curve, it becomes an exponential curve uh, or a different curve, depends if you go under or over the, uh, the, the value of 1, I think. And that means that, you know, the, the break uh, response is different, is different. Yeah, the Fanatic should work very nicely. Andrea Gallet, che problemi ha la SIA dietro le vetture? Eh, funziona benissimo. Non, non capisco fixare cosa. <laughs> Tanvir, calm down, don't spam the chat. Uh, just one question is more than enough. Uh, just uh, you change the brake bias. You have multiple uh, solutions. You go in the garage, on the setup, right? Mechanical grip, and you change the brake bias here. Okay? So, this is what you have to do. If you want to change the brake bias while you're driving, then you have to assign uh, controls on your steering wheel or your bottom box, I don't know, while, you, so while you're driving, you can change the brake bias, uh, and you can see that around here while I'm changing from my steering wheel. You see, I'm going up and down. How you assign controls? You go into the options, even when you are on the track like this, controls, and then you move down on the electronics, and here you have increase brake bias, decrease brake bias. You just click on it and assign a control on your steering wheel. <laughs> no worries, probably, okay, no, no worries, Tanvir, we, we try to always read everything and uh, don't, don't worry about it. Um, all right. Poasma, we are, I, ho I really hope you can, you can solve the problem, mate. 
Uh, what I can tell you is if the steering wheel is not one by one, as we said, and especially if you feel strange things like it's all very twitchy in force feedback or there's no force feedback for whatever reason, something is wrong in the configuration. If you don't feel any forces, either when you're stopped like this or when you are, you know, when you're driving like this, okay, so like this, if it doesn't move along, you see, like that, if you don't feel any vibration, look, when I'm, when I'm braking, so let's, let me show you, look, look at the steering wheel, right? So, braking, look at that. If, if you don't see those things, then something doesn't work in the configuration. Might be the combination of things that you have, or I don't know, you might want to change a USB port on the console. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you honestly, because I don't know, uh, I'm ignorant in, in, that, in that situation. Uh, or it might be a bug somewhere uh, in the game that is, is dependent on, the com on some kind of combination of hardware uh, and, and console. Uh, because on other combina normal combinations of, you know, Thrustmaster wheels, Logitech wheels, Fanatec wheels, everything works. We tried it and you can see it on the YouTube uh, streams of, of uh, various YouTubers, pretty famous ones too. So it works. We have, you know, the, the proof that it works. But again, it might very well be that some kind of combination doesn't let it work. And unfortunately, you were the unlucky one. Uh. <laughs> uh, yes, pro Pretty much all the performance fixes found uh, in the console version it came back to PC version. In fact, if you if you saw the frame rate that the Assetto Corsa Compensione was doing at version 1 and the frame rate that it does nowadays, we have some very, very important gains on that. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thank you so much. Really happy that you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Uh, what? What? What more to say? I hope you really enjoyed uh, tonight's stream. Uh, it was lots of theory, I understand that, I know it's a difficult stream, I don't expect to do, you know, thousands of uh, views, but for the more hardcore of you guys, I hope that you've learned something, I hope that I was clear, I'm not a professor in such things, so it might be that I have made mistakes, feel free to write down, um, feel free to, to you know, uh, correct me if I've done some mistakes, always keep in mind that I'm trying to simplify in a correct possible way things so that uh, you guys understand not to get an engineering degree because you don't need that, I don't need that but to understand how you can use this knowledge to your driving technique and to set up the car better um, so well that is all, I guess, for, for tonight. Thank you so much for the new uh, subscribers, uh, Aaron and Tanvir and Tintop. Thank you so much for the subscription. Uh, as usual, remember, hit the like button, subscribe if you liked it, uh, tell your friends, tell your family, whatever. And um, see you on Friday. It's going to be Italian for most of the part, but I will try to reply uh, questions in, uh, in English. And uh, I will be doing pretty much the same thing that we did uh, here last Friday, uh, but this time spa with the BMW. Uh, so yeah, pretty much the same stuff. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you will understand also uh, what I'm saying in Italian. All right. So thank you so much. See you on the next live stream. 